Another thing that often pops up in debate when on the subject of Apollo samples is the lunar samples collected by the unmanned Russian flights. The claim made by propagandists is straightforward. The Apollo rock samples can't be faked. They match up with the lunar samples that were collected by the Russian unmanned missions. Phil Plate made that very claim during his debate with Joe Rogan on the Penn Gillette radio show. The Russians did bring back, uh, they had a sample return mission, the Zon, I think it was Zon 5, it was one of, their, one of their missions that went to the moon and brought back, it was like 100 grams, it was a very, very small sample because it's, it, you know, it's hard to bring back a lot. And, um, you know, chemically and all of that, they were identical to, or at least, you know, close enough to what was found on the moon. This claim was also echoed in Wikipedia's section on the Apollo hoax. The Soviet samples were cited as proof for the American samples. The moon rocks also share the same characteristics as the Soviet lunar samples that were obtained at a later date. I responded to this in Moonfaker Exhibit D. I pointed out that given the fact that the Russians were granted access to the Apollo samples prior to their own retrieval of moon rock, it's possible that the Soviets simply scraped a few grams off the samples the Americans gave them and then simply falsely claimed that they collected it themselves. Now, I never said this is actually what the Soviets did. I simply said it was a possibility. Assuming, of course, that what Phil Plate says is true, that chemically, the Russian samples were identical to what was found on Apollo. Guess how Webb responded to this? He responded by ignoring the fact that everything I said about the Soviet samples was made in response to Phil Plate. And he attempted to try and pin Phil Plate's claims on me. Let's just speculate for a moment here, shall we? We know that the Apollo moon rocks brought back by Apollos 11 and 12 were made available to the Soviets. And to America's then 55 kilograms, Luna 16 only picked up about 105 grams. Or did it? Knowing that the USSR did exaggerate about some of their technical capabilities in the space field, and also knowing that they had access to the Apollo samples, how do we know that Russia didn't simply scrape 105 grams off a moon rock from Apollo and then pass it off as something that they collected? If this is what they did, then it is no wonder why the American and Russian samples would be identical. Identical? <laughs> That's easy to disprove, but why bother? Whether the Soviets gathered their own lunar samples or somehow concocted their samples from what NASA supposedly gave them, it would have no bearing at all on whether the Apollo moon rocks are real or not. I'm not quite sure where Jerry was going with this particular red herring. Not sure where I was going? Bull, you know perfectly well where I was going. And it ain't a red herring, it's a response to Phil Plate's claims. Why not show us the beginning of the segment you showed? Now I know what you're thinking. What about the lunar samples retrieved by the Russian lunar probes? They turned out to be identical to the Apollo samples. The Russians did bring back, uh, they had a sample return mission, the Zon, I think it was Zon 5, it was one of, their, one of their missions that went to the moon and brought back, it was like 100 grams, it was a very, very small sample because it's, it, you know, it's hard to bring back a lot. And, um, you know, chemically and all of that, they were identical to, or at least, you know, close enough to what was found on the moon. This is something else that the propagandists are very open about. However, they are also open on the fact that many Soviet space claims have been proven to be propaganda. For years, it was written that the dog Laika died aboard Sputnik 2, a week after launch, when her oxygen ran out. In fact, she died of heat exhaustion five hours after liftoff. The Soviets also covered up the fact that Yuri Gagarin had to eject from his Vostok capsule during re-entry. And Alexei Leonov supposedly had to deflate his spacesuit before he could get back inside Voshkod too. They were also able to cover up the embarrassment of their failed N1 moon rocket and denied its existence for 30 years. 
Everyone knows you can't trust a proven liar. So why do the propagandists take Mother Russia's word for it? We already know that the Apollo soil samples were distributed to about 50 geologists across the world, including geologists in Russia. As Windley tells us on his website, It's difficult to imagine what influence, if any, the US government could have had over the Soviet Academy of Sciences, whose geologists examined Apollo lunar samples. By the time Lunar 16 returned Russia's first soil sample, Apollos 11 and 12 had already allegedly returned nearly 56 kilograms of lunar rock. A few tiny samples of which were made available to the few geologists across the world. Again, including the Ruskies. In response to the arguments that the Apollo samples could have been retrieved by robots, as the Russians did, NASA believers refute this, arguing that Apollo retrieved many, many kilograms of rock, whereas Russia was only able to pick up a few measly grams of soil. Quite true. To get an idea of just how little the Soviet Union was able to collect, a bag of sugar holds more grains than all three Soviet moon samples combined. And the failed Luna 15 wasn't their first attempt to try and retrieve soil without the aid of humans. Twice the Soviets had tried before, and they failed to gather any soil successfully. Let's just speculate for a moment here, shall we? And you know the rest. For Weber to claim that he didn't know where I was going with this is an outright lie. Because the claim I responded to came right at the beginning of Moonfaker Exhibit D Part 5. Gee, I wonder how he could have missed that. Especially considering that he used clips that came directly before and after this segment. In fact, in his later video on the Soviets and space radiation, Webb used a clip that came during this segment. Wasn't it Jera who said, Everyone knows you can't trust a proven liar. So why do the propagandists take Mother Russia's word for it? Clearly, Webb knew very well that I was responding to Phil Plate. And then he pretended that he wasn't sure where I was going with this, when he very well knew otherwise. If there was any doubt before, it can be confidently stated again, Phil Webb is outright lying to his audiences. And once again, it's not a red herring, it's staying on topic. As for Jarrah's claim that the Luna 16 samples were identical to Apollo samples... Not my claim, <laughs> Phil Plate's claim. A claim which I was responding to. Webb is clearly going after the wrong guy. The scientists who actually analyzed those samples would disagree. There is an excellent resource available on the Johnson Space Center's website called The Handbook of Lunar Soils compiled by Dr. Richard Morris in 1983. This handbook is a complete catalog of the material properties of all non-core samples of soil returned by the Apollo missions. It contains all the soil sample reports, including this one on soil sample number 10002, prepared by Dr. Ursula Marvin and her team at Harvard in 1971. This sample report lists the weight percentage for the major elements and the PPM for trace elements and is typical for all the Apollo 11 samples. The iron oxide is 15.34% by weight, titanium oxide is 7.75% by weight, and thorium is about 1.9 ppm by weight. In 1998, Dr. Rennie Korotiv wrote a paper summarizing these three element weight percentages from the handbook into two simple charts, which include data for all the Apollo and Luna missions, as well as a handful of lunar meteorites. The values we just read from the handbook for soil sample number 10002, iron oxide 15.34%, titanium oxide 7.75%, and thorium 1.9 ppm, are plotted in the little blue box for Apollo 11 on these charts. It's rather obvious from Andy's chart that Luna 16 samples have an iron oxide weight percentage almost identical to the Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 samples. But... The titanium oxide weight percentage is different between the Luna 16 and the Apollo 11 samples, 
and the ppm of thorium is different between the Luna 16 and the Apollo 12 samples. In other words, although they have similar chemical compositions, the Luna 16 samples don't exactly match either of the two groups of Apollo samples available at the time. And a blend of the two Apollo samples would differ from the Luna 16 samples in both the titanium oxide and thorium concentrations. So, no, the Luna 16 samples are not identical to any of the Apollo samples. In fact, each of the missions seem to have their own particular signature that distinguishes them from the others. There is a lesson to be learned here. Never take anything that Phil Plate says is factual without checking it. Why? Because evidently, if what Flate is telling you is bogosity, and you reply to that bogosity, and in doing so paraphrase it, Flate's followers, such as Phil Webb, will try and pin that erroneous claim on you. In any case, Phil Webb, from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of the Moon Hoax crowd, I wish to thank you for permanently dispelling the false claims that Phil Plate and others have been peddling for years as so-called proof for their cause the claim that the Apollo samples and the Russian samples were identical. I couldn't have done it better myself. Quite frankly, had I been aware of this information during production of Exhibit D, I would have most certainly used it to disprove Phil Plate's claims. Now, giving Plate the benefit of the doubt, according to the Lunar Sample Compendium, the Lunar 16 soil is 3.36% titanium, 16.66% iron, and is only 0.8 parts per million of thorium. Reading through the Handbook of Lunar Soils, we find that the Apollo 12 soil sample 12037 has virtually the same proportions of titanium oxide and ferrous oxide as the Lunar 16 sample, but thorium is not listed. Maybe it does have the same ppm of thorium, maybe it just hasn't been measured for or detected yet. If that's the case, it could be argued that Korotev's plotting of this data was not as comprehensive as Webb made it out to be. But even if the sample did have the same thorium content as the Luna 16 soil, there are still other characteristics that make the Soviet soils differ from the Apollo samples. As we learned previously, the Apollo samples have ferric iron in them, a characteristic of exposure to the atmosphere. The Russian samples do not. There is a linear relationship between the average iron content and the absorption coefficient of a strong polarized crystal field band at 1,250 nanometers in the Luna 29 plagioclase, a soil that is not reportedly oxidized or hydrated. However, the iron values of plagioclase crystals from the altered Apollo 15 and 16 samples fall off this line, a factor that may be related to the presence of significant proportions of ferric iron. The Lunar Sample Compendium reveals a few other differences that are worth bringing up. In regards to the Lunar 24 soil, it seems there is more to this sample than just what they call the unusually low titanium content. In addition to the very low titanium basalt, there is another kind of basaltic particle in Luna 24 finds that was not seen in the Apollo sample. It is termed metabasalt and is characterized by a fine-grained granular texture and iron-rich pyroxene exolution trend, figure 9. It has the same bulk composition as the igneous textured basalts. I also looked up the paperwork for the Luna 20 soil and learned that, compared to Apollo 14, 16, and 17 finds, it has the absolute lowest content for trace elements. I also learned this about Luna 16. Various investigators noticed that Luna 16 basalts are more aluminous than most basalts returned by Apollo missions. 